Yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, 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 okay. I forgot this though. Uh, uh, in Mark 11, it talk about, it talk about if you don't forgive, you can't, you won't be forgiven. But in Mark 11, it talk about moving the mountain by faith. See in Luke 17, it talk about that tree. Cause that's stuff that's on the inside of you that needs to be removed by faith needs to be overcome by faith stuff on the inside. That's that sycamine tree. That's that root of bitterness stuff that's on the inside. But in Mark 11, they talk about moving the mountain. See, the mountain is something that's on the outside. Zechariah chapter four, verse seven, mountains represent obstacles. He, he talk about having the faith to move a mountain in Mark 11. That have to do with obstacles, something that God called you to do, some type of project or just something that, that God has called you to do. And you got obstacles. That's what the mountain represent. The mountain represents external, uh, external obstacles. Um, just like Zechariah was trying to build the temple, you know what I mean? And they had obstacles, they had opposition. <clears throat> they had people trying to hinder the work, you know what I mean? So, Mountains represent external obstacles. Zechariah 4, 7, Mark 11, I think 22, 23. You know what I'm saying? He talk about moving the mountain. The mountain represents external obstacles to you doing what God has called you to do. But the sycamine tree in Luke 17 represents stuff that's on the inside of you that would hinder your relationship with God, hinder your salvation, you know what I mean? Hinder you from being the person. Oh, that's good. That's good. Luke 17, the tree represents stuff that's on the inside of you. It could be pride too. It could be a root of pride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be a root of pride. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. But the sycamine tree, it represents stuff that's on the inside of you that would hinder you from being the person that God has called you to be. Luke 17, sycamine tree. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, that represents stuff that's on the inside of you that would keep you or hinder you from being the person that God has called you to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the mountain in Mark 11 represents obstacles that would hinder you from doing the stuff that God has called you to do. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's it right there. Yeah, that's it right there. We finna move on now, but that's good. Let me say that one more time. That just felt good. That just felt good. Mark 11, mountains, having the faith to move mountains. Mountains represent obstacles that would stop you or hinder you from doing the stuff that God has called you to do. Zechariah 4, 7. Yeah, it's by the spirit of God and it's by faith and it's by grace through faith. Yeah, yeah, that you move that stuff. Mountains want to stop you from doing the work and doing the stuff that God called you to do. And then the sycamine tree, you're dealing with roots, you're dealing with trees, plants, you're dealing with fruit, stuff on the inside that would hinder you or stop you or keep you from being the person that God would have you to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. So put all that together, man. And matter of fact, in Zechariah 4, 6, he said, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So we know it's by his spirit. It's by the power of the Holy Ghost. Then he said, you're going to build the, you going to build the temple. And he said, you're going to lay the cornerstone, the headstone, the capstone. And he said, with shoutings, crying grace unto it. So look, you got grace, you got faith, and you got the Holy Ghost. That's how you overcome right there. Grace through faith by the Holy Ghost. That's how you move mountains, obstacles on the outside. That's how you remove bad roots, bad plants, bad fruit on the inside by grace through faith 
and by the Holy Ghost, by the power of God. Yeah, yeah. Them three things, grace, faith, and the Holy Ghost, the power of God. He'll get you right. He'll move obstacles out of your way so you can do what God called you to do. And he'll get you right on the inside. Perfect that which concern if you on the inside dealing with bad fruit, bad roots, pluck them up by the Holy Ghost, by faith, through grace, by grace, through faith. The spirit of God gets you right on the inside, purging you, cleansing you, sanctifying you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting that stuff out of you that don't need to be in you. You know what I'm saying? That's a work of the spirit. It's a sanctifying work. Yeah, yeah. So you can be the person that God called you to be and bear the fruit, character fruit that God will have you to bear. Yeah, man. Okay, okay. Now we moving on. And God just gave me a little bit of, uh, hold on. Let me try to keep up with my stuff so I can put it in the, in the uh, description. Yeah, let me try. Okay, uh, I just got a little word about water baptism, man. Uh, I was just doing my Bible reading, and I just wanted to break some stuff down, man. Water baptism. Uh, water baptism is one of the ordinances of the faith. It's uh, it's something that that a person does. You know, early, it's it's something that is good to do early upon salvation. Water baptism is like your initiation. You know, it's just like your initiation. Like if you want to get down with a gang, there's an initiation. There's an initiation act. You know, it could be uh, you might get jumped in. You might get sworn in. You might say some type of allegiance, pledge your allegiance. You might put in some work. You know what I mean? And uh, stuff like that. You know what I mean? you There's an initiation act, though. Uh, even in the occult, there's an initiation act. And, and they actually use baptism, too. You know what I mean? But there's there's uh, initiatory, there's initiation acts. Uh, in some circles of pimping, there's an initiation, an initiation ceremony. Um. That's kind of what a wedding ceremony is because you don't have to have a ceremony. You know what I mean? But a ceremony is like your initiation into marriage. Um, yeah. So a lot of, a lot of major things, they have initiation acts. Baptism, it's like an initiation act. You know, most of the time that was one of the first things they did or in the early church, you know what I'm saying? That was one of the first things they did was water baptism. Uh, I just want to speak on it real quick. I don't want to speak on it real quick. I'm going to use that scripture out of Peter, and then I'm going to use Romans, and I'm going to use one out of Acts 22. Okay, so water baptism is a public proclamation it's a public proclamation of and confession of Christ. And it's also you identifying with Christ. It has to do with uh it has to do with with not being ashamed. You know, he said uh he said if you won't confess me before men, I won't confess you before my father and before the holy angels. So baptism, it had to do with your public proclamation and confession of Christ and your identification with him. You know what I mean? Basically saying you're not ashamed. I'm identifying with Jesus publicly. I'm not ashamed. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm stepping into this life. Number two, it's a public initiation. You know what I'm saying? It's an initiation act. And then number three, it's a symbolic act of salvation. Being baptized is what it represents is being baptized into Christ's death. Dying to your old life, who you were before you knew Christ, the life you lived without honoring God, doing your thing, 
It represents you dying to that and receiving new life in Christ. Receiving new life in Christ, a death and a resurrection. I died to who I was before I stepped into this life with Jesus. And now I'm coming up as a new person about this life with Christ. I died to the old me and I'm awake to the new me living with Jesus, living for Jesus. That's what it represents. Them the three things that represent a public proclamation and a confession of Jesus identifying with him. Number two, initiation publicly. That don't mean it had to be a whole bunch of people around, but it's a public act. And then number three, a symbolic act of salvation, being baptized in the Christ's death, you dying to your old life and receiving new life in Christ, coming up as a person, coming up out of the water as a person that's focused on living for Jesus. Whereas before time, I was just doing me or doing whatever else. Now I'm going to go to uh, Romans 6. Yeah, man, water baptism, man. Not to mention Jesus uh, was baptized in the water. And, you know, he really wasn't going, he, he didn't, he didn't really want to baptize Jesus. He said, you know, he knew he was the lamb of God and all that. Well, actually he didn't know that yet. Cause he said the purpose of John baptizing was so who he see the spirit come upon and stay upon him. He would be, he would know that he was the Messiah. But uh, but he he must have already knew something about Jesus because they were cousins anyway. But he knew Jesus was, I guess, a, a righteous man because Jesus had never, never sinned. So he knew Jesus was a righteous man. And, uh, you know, he said, I have need to be baptized to you. And Jesus said, you know, suffer it to be so, you know, what I'm saying let, let, let it be because baptism represented in the time of John. It, it represented repentance. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm done with my old ways and now I'm living for God, you know, so it still has similarities to baptism today. You know, it was the, the baptism of water for repentance, you know, so like for remission of sins, like, you know, I was living a, a baptism of repentance, you know, I was living a certain way, but now I'm going to commit myself to God. So that's why they were baptized, a baptism of water unto repentance, um, and at that time it represented salvation, you know what I mean? Until Christ was manifested and, you know, you had to put your faith in him, but they was believing in the one that was to come, the one who John was preaching, you know, so they had forward faith, you know, they repented of their sins. They were baptized in water unto repentance and they was going to live for God and put their faith in the one that John was preaching, the one that was to come. Cause that's why John was the forerunner. All right. Okay. Okay. But anyway, Romans six verses four verses three and four. He said, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized in the Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Yeah, that, that can be applied to water baptism. That can be applied to salvation in general, but it can also be applied to uh, water baptism. Cause when you get saved, you're baptized into the body of Christ. You're baptized into his death. So you can live a new life, you know what I mean? So you can walk in newness of life. But that's the exact same thing that water baptism represents. Uh, oh, yeah. Go to Acts 22. Now, this scripture right here can be a little tricky. Oh, I didn't even read the one out of Peter. I'm, I'm going to go back to the one in Peter. Uh, Acts chapter 22, verses... 16. Now check this out. This is Paul giving his testimony. He said, uh, 
somebody said to him might have been Ananias. And now why tarriest thou? What you waiting on? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, water baptism is not what wash away his sins. What washes away his sins is calling on the name of the Lord. So don't don't get that twisted. Being baptized in water is not what wash away your sins. The blood of Jesus is what wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord, anyone who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Them that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's not water baptism that wash away your sins, though. It's calling on the name of the Lord that wash in sincerity. Is calling on the name of the Lord that wash away your sins, not water baptism. So don't don't get that twisted. And then another verse. Th- this verse is really kind of difficult. It's a little easier in the Amplified, but it's even difficult in the Amplified to me. Uh, 1 Peter 3.21. I'll start with verse 20. It says, Which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing or a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a difficult scripture. (laughs) But uh, it says, The like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh or washing away dirt from the body, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So somebody might get to thinking that water baptism saved them. Nah, water baptism don't save you. But water baptism, it's not about washing your body. Because in the Old Testament, a lot of time when they was unclean, they would have to wash their clothes and bathe their flesh in water. That's all external, though. You know what I mean? So it's not the external washing of dirt from the body that may come from baptism. That ain't what it's about. But it's the answer of a good conscience. First off, good conscience because you're obeying. Water baptism is a is a command. Repent and be baptized. So a good conscience and you're dying, you represent your death to the old you. Everything I did, the life I lived, I'm dead to that. You know, water baptism. I'm, you identifying with the death of Christ. It's the death of your old life. So now you awake you arise, you resurrect to a new life. So now you